Good morning, everyone. Uh, the room is a little slow in filling up, so we're going to wait a few minutes before we start, but I want to welcome everyone to our conference today, COVID-19, the virus preparedness in the time of crisis, and I can't read the rest of the title because I'm in the middle of the screen, so I'll let Bob uh, Miller cover that. A few housekeeping notes. You are all on mute and your videos are turned off. We would like you to use the Q&A feature to ask questions. It's at the bottom of your screen. And go ahead and type them in and tell us where you're from. One good thing about this conference is that we have been able to encourage people to attend that normally wouldn't come when we have it in person. I know some of my colleagues from New York, and I see Dave Hudson is here from UVA. When we're at conferences together, he typically stands in the back of the room. And I don't know if he's doing that now. I'll have to check with him later, but uh, I can't call out on him. It is now 9.03. We have, well, we're, we're filling up. Uh, we have over 200 people registered. So right now it looks like we're getting close to 70 in the room. And I see some questions already. Oh, people are just checking in. Don from Roy from the University of Maryland, thanks for being here. And I am going to now turn it over to Dr. Robert Miller, who's the Vice President of Research, my boss at George Washington University, to get us started. It's um, a difficult time here, but uh... I really do want to welcome everybody to this uh, CTSA Spring Meeting. Um, I particularly want to thank the partners, uh, the, the Science and Translational Center Institute at, at Children's National and the Georgetown Howard University Center for uh, Clinical and Translational Science. Uh, it's been, I think, a real challenge in putting this together and I really want to thank the event organizers, um, Dr. Sheila Garrity, Dr. Jane Otado at Howard University um, and Mary uh, Schmeidel at Georgetown University. This is, this is a difficult time for us. Um, obviously, the COVID-19 pandemic has caused us to move this meeting online. And that really has put a challenge, I think, to uh, putting this together and making it a, a web-based meeting this year. Lots of people have put uh, work into, into putting this together, and we really appreciate all the effort that they've done. Um, while we may not be in the same physical location, and you know, web meetings and Zoom meetings have been a sort of challenge over the last um, five to six weeks, um, <clears throat> it is really important that we continue our work together through this crisis. Uh, researchers at all our institutions are stepping up and beginning to lend their expertise to understanding the coronavirus and developing ways to mitigate its impact. We're putting aside long-standing projects and sort of reshuffling priorities to respond to this rapidly evolving uh, public health situation. Their creativity and dedication uh, is truly inspiring and we really appreciate the effort that they're doing. Uh, <clears throat> Times like this underscore the importance of our partnerships with our research collaborators, with our funders, with industry, and especially with centers established to strengthen the clinical and translational science. Getting through the current situation requires all of us coming together and sharing information. Today, you're gonna to hear from a number of federal partners and academic colleagues on a number of timely issues including the impact of COVID-19 on our various institutions. How those institutions are adapting and communicating as the facts on the ground change so rapidly. We'll be talking about best practices for sharing and managing data from human subjects to clinical research. And then how to manage the conflict of interest and the disclosures that are moving really quickly I think one of the things that's most challenging to a lot of us is how to understand and how to manage accelerating clinical trials, 
people are coming very quickly and saying, I want to do a clinical trial. I have a potential therapeutic. And how we actually deal with that, I think is a, is a really important question that you'll be discussing during the day. <laughs> Between our speakers and all of you on the, on the call and your expertise, we're looking forward to a very lively day of discussions. So thank you all for attending and participating. And I'm going to turn it back to Dr. Sheila Garrity now to introduce our first speaker. So Sheila, thank you. Thank you, Bob. So I am honored and I think we all are so very fortunate to have our first speaker, uh, Dr. Daniel Chertow. And he's a tenure track investigator in the critical care medicine department at the National Institutes of Health Clinical Center and in the laboratory of immunoregulation at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, which we all hear NIAID every day when we see Dr. Fauci on the news. He is a fellow in the American College of Critical Care Medicine and a member of the Infectious Diseases Society of America and the American Public Health Association. He serves as a senior officer in the United States Public Health Service. Dr. Cherdo's translational research program employs advanced animal models and detailed natural history studies in humans to improve understanding of the pathophysiology and molecular pathogenesis of severe emerging viral infections, including influenza A, Ebola, and Zika viruses to guide improved clinical management of these infections. His recent investigations have focused on the study of influenza and bacterial co-pathogenesis in a mouse model and characterization, characterization of the clinical, microbiologic, and molecular virology features of fatal 1918 influenza and pneumonia cases. Today, he will be discussing the emerging infectious disease, the spread and characteristics of COVID-19 and issues related to clinical trials and regulatory efforts. And I do apologize for maybe mispronouncing your name. I looked up various pronunciations on the web this morning and hope I chose the right one. Please, everyone, if we were in person, we would clap for Dr. Chertow. Uh, welcome him and I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Sheila. And thank you for the invitation to, uh, to join you all this morning. It is my pleasure to be here and um, it's my pleasure to speak about Pandemic Coronavirus 2019. I'm gonna advance the slide. Um, I have no disclosures. While this is a global pandemic, by now most in this audience realize that it's also very personal. Uh, we have loved ones, friends, colleagues, peers, and neighbors who have become infected and some who have died. Uh, I commend each of you for the work you're doing and send my condolences to those who have suffered a loss and my deepest gratitude to the broader community of individuals supporting this fight locally across the United States and globally. Knowledge is our ally and information is flowing in faster than most of us can assimilate. The purpose of today's talk is to provide an overview of what we know and in no way is meant to be a comprehensive treaty on COVID-19. It's too early for that as knowledge on this uh, disease is rapidly expanding. With that said, I'm going to take a step back and provide an overview of coronavirus biology. I'm going to discuss features of uh, the epidemiology, the pathogenesis, the clinical manifestations and management, and then I'll conclude with a view to the future. And, and that will include a discussion of what we're doing now to limit spread of this virus and what we can expect next. Coronaviruses are spherical, enveloped, positive stranded RNA viruses. There are four genera that include alpha, beta, delta, and gamma viruses. These are diverse in nature with a wide host range. Alpha and beta viruses cause human respiratory illnesses. The viral envelope has three primary associated structural proteins, including the spike, the spike protein that contributes to viral binding and entry into host cells, and the envelope and membrane proteins are also associated with the envelope. 
the nuclear protein encapsidates and protects the viral nucleic acid or RNA genome. Next slide, please. There are four endemic human coronaviruses, and these are termed 229E NL63, OC43, and HKU1. These are circled in black on the phylogenetic tree shown here. These viruses cause an estimated 15 to 30 percent of common colds annually. There are two previously recognized severe human coronaviruses, including Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, or SARS-CoV, and Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus, or MERS-CoV. During 2002 to 2003, SARS resulted in an estimated 8,096 cases and 774 deaths, with no cases detected since. MERS emerged in 2012 on the Arabian Peninsula with intermittent outbreaks resulting in a total of 2,494 cases and 850 cases reported to date. This virus, however, MERS-CoV, does not result in sustained human-to-human -human spread. Next, please. In December of 2019, a cluster of pneumonia cases in Wuhan City, China, was reported to the World Health Organization. These cases shared a common exposure to a local seafood and animal market. Within weeks, a novel coronavirus termed SARS-CoV-2 was isolated and sequenced. An electron micrograph of the virus is shown here. The genetic sequence is most similar to that of bat coronaviruses. As of April 20th, 2,241,778 cases and 152,551 deaths have been reported to the World Health Organization globally. These counts significantly underestimate true cases and deaths due to underreporting. Over the past about one month, cases have been rapidly rising in the United States. As of yesterday, 720,630 cases, 37,202 deaths have been reported to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Again, these numbers likely grossly underestimate the true counts and deaths in the United States. Accumulating epidemiologic data suggests that among the total cases of COVID-2019, approximately 14% or, or so develop severe illness, 5% develop critical illness, and perhaps as many as 2% of individuals die. However, these data vary by population demographics, level of medical care available, and other factors. Among more than 44,000 confirmed cases that were reported from the Chinese Centers for Disease Control, case fatality rates ranged from zero in children aged nine years and younger, and approximately 15% among individuals aged 80 years and older. Next slide, please. There have now been multiple large case series describing the clinical manifestations of COVID-19, for which, for which for the most part paint a, a similar picture. Presented here are data from a cohort of 1,000 hospitalized patients in China. On average, patients were in their late 40s with the male predominance. The most common presenting symptoms included fever, cough, fatigue, and dyspnea. Common laboratory findings include leukopenia, lymphopenia, leukocytosis. Among those with severe illness, elevated serum creatinine, 
transaminases, bilirubin, and cardiac enzymes, as well as disordered coagulation, have been observed. Radiographically, bilateral ground glass opacifications early in the disease course may rapidly progress to bilateral densely consolidated multilober opacities. Illness timeline has been well described among these 41 hospitalized patients and largely has held true among other cohorts. Following an average five-day incubation period, clinical worsening and progression to respiratory failure occurred between days seven and 10 of illness. The predominant clinical complications described among COVID-19 patients include viral ARDS with possible bacterial co-infection, renal failure, renal insufficiency or renal failure, hepatic injury, disseminated intravascular coagulation, as well as venal thromboembolism, and distributive, or in some cases, cardiogenic shock. We can expect that additional clinical phenotypes will come to light as the pandemic progresses. One phenotype that has been described at the case report level is acute myopericarditis. In this report, a previously healthy 53-year-old woman presented to the hospital with a fever and cough for one week and was determined to be uh, SARS-CoV-2 positive. She was not hypoxic, although her uh, blood pressure was low at 90 systolic over 50 diastolic, and her admitting EKG showed diffuse ST segment elevations consistent with pericarditis. A 2D echocardiogram showed an ejection fraction of 40%, and a cardiac MRI, which is shown here, showed marked bilateral, biventricular myocardial interstitial edema consistent with myocarditis. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention has issued guidance on the use of personal protective equipment for the care of COVID-19 patients in healthcare settings. These recommendations balance risk with potential scarcity of personal protective equipment. Minimum suggested requirements include gloves, gowns, eye protection, and a face shield, an N95 mask slash respirator is preferred if available and advised for all aerosol generating procedures such as endotracheal intubation. A number of organizations have put forth guidelines for the clinical management of COVID-19 patients, including the Society for Critical Care Medicine, in the Surviving Sepsis Guidelines. 36 experts from 12 countries issued strong or weak recommendations on best practice on 50 topics in adult COVID-19 patient critical care management. Next slide, please. I'm only going to highlight a few of these recommendations such as the use of high flow nasal cannula, preferentially over non-invasive positive pressure ventilation, and avoiding delays in invasive mechanical ventilation when otherwise clinically indicated. Among patients with ARDS, low tidal volume ventilation to maintain plateau pressures below 30, and evaluation and treatment for secondary bacterial infection are recommended. There are presently no compelling data to support empiric use of antivirals, hydroxychloroquine, other immune modulators, or other experimental therapies largely outside of a randomized clinical trial setting. Currently, we have limited insight into pathogenesis of this disease, but I'll provide a brief overview of some of what we do know. 
SARS-CoV spilled over from an animal reservoir and perhaps into a yet to be identified intermediate host and ultimately into the human population. Since then, efficient, sustained human to human spread has led to the current pandemic. Transmission is thought to occur primarily by large respiratory droplets via fomites or con contaminated surfaces, as well as the potential for airborne transmission during aerosol generating procedures in the healthcare setting. Once exposed, the virus infects respiratory epithelial cells, there's an electron micrograph with the arrows showing the small viral particles associated with the ciliated respiratory epithelio, epithelium of the pseudostratified respiratory epithelium here. Virus may progress to induce pneumonia and ultimately severe lung injury, and then goes on to disseminate in the blood, resulting in either direct or indirect organ injury and dysfunction. Target cells and tissues and pathogen versus host contributions to organ injury are only now beginning to become elucidated. Few postmortem studies have been performed on COVID-19 patients, although these reports are increasingly being uh, revealed in the medical literature. In this fatal case, lung histopathology was characterized by diffuse alveolar damage, lymphocytic infiltrate into the lung parenchyma, and viral cytopathic changes, which are shown in panels A and B above. Microvesicular steatosis was observed in the liver in this patient, and few mononuclear cells, which were largely unremarkable, were observed in an otherwise normal appearing heart tissue. In a separate study that was published in the Annals of Internal Medicine, these investigators performed an immunohistochemical stain for viral antigen in lung tissue. The picture shown on the left is uh, the immunohistochemical stain for viral antigen across lung tissue, showing widely, dis widely distributed antigen throughout the lung, and then the box portion there highlights a single alveolus, where if you look to the right, the green arrows indicate sloughed infected pneumocytes into the center of the alveolar lumen, and the blue arrows reveal intact pneumocytes that are also infected. Next slide, please. Current measures in the United States to limit the spread uh, of, of this uh, pandemic include restrictions on travel and movement within our communities. Uh, there have been efforts at increased testing capacity, as well as efforts to redouble the standard public health interventions that include case identification, case isolation, contact tracing, and ultimately quarantine. Additionally, there are remarkable efforts that are ongoing related to uh, vaccine and therapeutic development. Uh, one of the topics of today's panel discussion is the efforts around this therapeutic development. And one thing that I'll say is that, you know, in, in many ways, uh, the playbook around therapeutic development uh, has, has been uh, put on the sidelines. Typically, uh, in the past for therapeutic development, uh, the approach has been to evaluate uh, potential therapeutics in vitro, have an, in the setting of promising in vitro results, to then move those studies into small animal models to show uh, in vivo efficacy, and then ultimately into large animal models that then uh, prioritizes uh, what should be moved into human studies uh, for evaluation of phase one or safety studies and ultimately phase two and phase three uh, efficacy studies. 
In the setting of the current pandemic, there is truly an unprecedented effort to accelerate that process and multiple compounds, potential therapeutics have been moved into uh, randomized clinical trials to assess potential benefit uh, in, in the setting of the current outbreak. Next slide, please. So what, what can we expect next? Uh, I think that's a question that's on many of our minds. Uh, and, and rather than, than reinventing the wheel, what I did is I went back and I borrowed from the World Health Organization's uh, 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 concept paper on the phases of an influenza pandemic. Uh, this is not an influenza pandemic. This is a coronavirus pandemic. But there are similarities uh, as the way that we think about these phases of a pandemic. And if you look at this slide, you will see that the early phase re reflects uh, infection in animals, uh, at which point there's a zoonotic spillover event into the human population. Uh, and then that's occurs occurred very rapidly in this case, those phases one through three. Because of the efficiency of transmission of this pathogen, we quickly moved into phase four, where there was sustained human-to-human -human transmission that was largely limited uh, to China and, uh, and, the, and the regions around China. And then within a, a short interval uh, between December and, uh, and, and certainly March in the United States, we quickly moved into phases five and six of this pandemic, where we have widespread human infection globally. And now we find ourselves in this phase of the pandemic, and there's ongoing discussion about when is the time to reduce uh, community measures, social distancing, to, uh, to uh, get back to life as normal while we remain in this phase of the pandemic. What I wanna highlight is uh, the next two phases to the right, which are the post-peak, which talk about the possibility of recurrent events. I think by now, most individuals on this call realize that this is a highly transmissible pathogen, that it is not going to go away uh, uh, that uh, that uh, if the, our guard is let down as it relates to public health interventions, uh, then it will recrudesce in uh, communities. We've seen that in Asia, and uh, we will see that here in the event that we let our guard down. And then if you move all the way to the right of this slide, the post-pandemic, disease activity at seasonal levels. That raises a really interesting question. I mean, again, this slide was designed for influenza, but it raises an interesting question about coronaviruses. And, and that's gonna take me to my, to my next slide. So in this slide, uh, this is unpublished data, but there are similar data that have been published uh, that describe the seasonality of endemic human coronaviruses in the United States. Uh, between 2011 and 2018. And what, what we show here is the incidence of positive coronavirus, coronavirus tests by month, by month. And this data was generated from the Premier Healthcare database over this extended interval in the United States. And it included respiratory samples from 131,557 inpatients. So a large inpatient as well as outpatient population across 132 hospitals in the United States. And what you can see here is that the, uh, that the incidence uh, of, of human endemic coronaviruses varies by season. And specifically the average incidence uh, was 6.6%. You can see in the winter months, the, uh, the, the vertical gray lines represent the month of December. So you can see around the month of December, December, January, February is the peak of when these seasonal endemic human coronaviruses circulate. And then in the summer months, they don't go away, but due to uh, environmental conditions, uh, they continue to circulate at a low level. And the incidence in the summer months was 
0.06%. Now, these are the, the endemic human coronaviruses. They don't necessarily portend what is going to be happening with, uh, with this uh, pandemic coronavirus. But I think what we can know is that even if uh, cases come down uh, during the summer months due to successful public health efforts, such as social distancing, and perhaps a contribution of less favorable environmental conditions for the virus in the summer, that as long as there remains a large susceptible population, that come the fall, that environmental conditions will once again favor increased transmission and spread of this virus. And so as a community, both locally, regionally, globally, uh, as we think about this, I think we need to be prepared for the next wave, what's coming next uh, uh, for, uh, in this pandemic as we wait for randomized trials to identify effective uh, therapies and as we wait for randomized trials to identify effective vaccines that then can be moved into the process of regulatory approval as well as the subsequent processing a process of, of widespread manufacturing and distribution of, of an effective vaccine, which as we all know has been described as, as, as it is going to take some time. Next slide, please. So in summary, SARS-CoV-2 is a new human coronavirus. It spreads efficiently from human to human. And Relatively speaking, the case fatality ratio is high. This outbreak is evolving. Updates on optimal care, effective therapies, and as well as vaccines can be expected. Sustained preparedness and ongoing response from the local and international level is essential. Thank you for your attention this morning. Dr. Churchill, thank you so much for that comprehensive and, and wide-ranging um, presentation. My name is Julia Sussman, and I'm Director of Research Regulatory Affairs at Children's National. Um, that was a phenomenal um, walkthrough of the virus from, from the biology to, to clinical treatment to the, the epidemiology. And thank you so much for, for providing us with, with that information. And thank you for the, the work that you do um, every day uh, taking care of, of patients and developing um, therapies for, uh, for this uh, pandemic. We're, we're, we're very appreciative of you, you being here today. I'd like to invite our participants to um, type in questions that they have for you using the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Um, and what I'll do is I'll go ahead and, and, and read those questions and ask you to, to respond to them as they come in. And while we wait for those, I'd like to take the, the moderator's prerogative and ask you if you could speak a little bit to some of the therapeutics that are being developed, some of the potential candidates for vaccines that are being developed and, and those, those processes. Yes, so thank you very much, Julia. Um, it was my pleasure to, um, to be part, a part of this process. And, um, you know, there it's, so as far as therapeutics, which is, um, you know, my, my, my research in my lab focuses largely on, on pathogenesis, trying to understand the molecular mechanisms of disease uh, with, the, with an eye towards uh, uh, identifying, you know, targets for effective therapeutics. Um, the same question that we all ask at the bedside, um, you know, what is, what is the right drug that intervenes at the right time for the right uh, amount of time uh, with the right target that ultimately is going to uh, to make a difference in the outcome of this disease. And, you know, I, I think I would put, you know, therapeutics uh, into sort of two, two primary categories um, that, and we're seeing, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, a dizzying array of the therapeutics that are being uh, moved very quickly into, uh, into randomized trials. Many of these are uh, existing uh, drugs that have a regulatory approval for other indications, uh, but they fall into two primary categories. One 
category are uh, therapeutics that target the pathogen. And the other category are therapeutics that, that target the host. And I find this, you know, I find it fascinating. Uh, and, you know, um, I spent a lot of time uh, thinking about and, and studying uh, Ebola virus disease as well. And I can remember in 2014, after I had returned from uh, West Africa and uh, cases were starting to be uh, exported to the United States for care here, there was the same dizzying array of uh, therapeutics that were being proposed that were targeting the pathogen and targeting the host. What I can say is that in the setting of a severe, uh, you know, disseminated uh, viral infection that has, uh, that has systemic effects, that, um, that timing matters. And so as we think about uh, therapeutics that are gonna target the pathogen, more likely than not, as we know with you know, bacterial sepsis and for other, other uh, severe infections, uh, more likely than not, if we're going to make a difference on the outcome, we're gonna need to target the pathogen relatively early in the disease course. Um, I think you saw the uh, immunohistochemistry stain of the lung. You know, if we target the pathogen at that later time point in the illness where the pathogen has already, you know, had its way and is widely disseminated in the lung and has caused, you know, direct virally mediated injury, triggered uh, abnormal inflammatory responses, disordered coagulation, um, then more likely than not in that piece, uh, targeting the pathogen is not going to do it which is, and that's not to say we shouldn't target the pathogen, we need to think about it. But when we target, but the other part is targeting the host. You know, we see folks that show up to the hospital uh, on average, they show up uh, later in the disease course. And I showed you that day six to day 10, where you have rapid progression of respiratory failure. And if individuals are, are already presenting at day six, uh, day seven, day eight, you know, um, somewhere in there, and there's this phenotype, and I'm sure there's many clinicians on this call that have experienced this perhaps at the bedside, where there's this, they talk about the second phase. It almost looks like it's the phase where the host adaptive immune system is kicking in and recognizing all of that virally infected lung tissue and perhaps tissues throughout the virus and is having this exuberant response trying to do its job, which is to clear parenchymally infected cells. And the question is that in the setting, and we don't know, maybe I, this is a hypothesis that that, 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 in that response that we're seeing clinically that's manifested by worsening lung injury, by distributive shock, by multi-organ dysfunction, the kidneys, the liver, by elevation of nonspecific markers of inflammation, the ESR, the ferritin, and the CRP, that, that we, we, make the, we make the assumption working in a black box that this is the host response. And I, and I think there's evidence to support that. So. If you target it upstream of that, you know, can we tamp that down and get the individual through that severe phase? There are some intriguing, you know, we have anecdotal evidence here uh, caring for these patients. There's been intriguing anecdotal evidence elsewhere that some of these modulators of the host response may have a benefit. And I can't wait for the RCT results to come out because to having these tools you know, firmly in our toolbox so that we can make a difference at the bedside is, is quite exciting. But we, but we need to go through the process. You know, the anecdotes don't get us there. We need to do the randomized trials to get an answer. Thank you for that. I have a, a couple of questions from, um, from participants uh, for you. One question is, you mentioned that the seasons provide environmental conditions that can prove more favorable or less favorable to transmission of the, of the flu and perhaps this novel coronavirus. Can you speak further about the kinds of conditions that you're thinking of um, and, and why they, they occur? Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. And I'm going to be careful not to go too far down the slippery slope of, you know, uh, of, uh, of the endemicity and, and what, you know, predicting the endemicity uh, of this virus. But what I will say is we don't need to guess. I mean, there are there's a hundred years of, of data around, you know, seasonality of certain respiratory viruses. We, has, we have less information about the seasonality of the four uh, mild endemic human coronaviruses, but that's not because they haven't been around. It's because they cause mild illness and we haven't really, you know, paid that much attention to them. And it's only 
since we've had these multiplex uh, molecular diagnostic tests, the ones that we have in the hospital where you take a respiratory uh, specimen and you send it to the lab and within you know, a couple hours you have an answer about whether you have any one of 15 respiratory of all pathogens present. And, and the use of those tests has increased over time. So that was what was reflected in the, in the data that I showed that over time, you know, the, the uptake of those tests has become available. And then if you query those results, you can see that the positive tests have this very clear seasonality for the endemic human coronaviruses. And that's not by accident. These are, these are enveloped RNA viruses. And so there's a spectrum, there's a nice graphic of pathogens that uh, talk about their hardiness in the environment. Mm -hmm. And even though, you know, there have been some nice studies that look at how long this virus survives on different surfaces and all these different types of things, for the most part in the environment of the spectrum, this is still on the, on the wimpy side, you know, on the wimpy side are enveloped RNA virus. That envelope, which is a bilipid membrane, makes the virus susceptible to uh, environmental conditions to heat, to drying out, to um, desiccants, uh, uh, to um, saponification, meaning soap that would break down, to any of these types of things that break down the envelope. And when the envelope's broken down, it's non viable. On the other side of that spectrum are sporulated bacteria that go into their, you know, go into their, uh, into their spore and can take any sorts of environmental conditions. So, with that said, you know, again, there are really excellent epidemiologic data, there are ecological data. And the issue is that in the winter, and it's not definitive, it's not just environmental conditions, it's social conditions, but in the winter we have dry, cold air. And that dry, cold air uh, fa favors the transmission of, uh, of viruses that are transmitted by the large respiratory droplet group. Um, this idea that, um, you know, uh, large respiratory droplets, larger than five microns. The idea is that they're, they're laden with liquid, they're laden, they're fluid heavy. And so what causes them to drop out of the air within six feet is because they're heavy. You cough, you sneeze, you speak, uh, and then they drop out of the air. Uh, small particles, the desiccate, the, the less than five microns, they dry out. And those small particles, when they dry out, they can transmit more easily. And so there's something about environmental conditions. There's something about crowding indoors during the winter months, but it's really important to keep in mind because even if we do a fantastic job with our social distancing to get the rates back down, we have to be careful in the summer not to declare a victory lap because if the environmental conditions give us a hand up, I'm not saying they're gonna make it go away. I think we all agree it's not gonna go away. But if they give us a hand up and bring cases down, we run the risk of complacency of doing a victory lap and saying we took care of this. Uh, and you know the biology, the ecology, the epidemiology all suggest that you know we got another round coming in the fall. And the issue with the fall is remember that if you think September, we got to get all the way to the next spring. And we've only been in this fight for a month, a couple months, and from fall to next spring is a lot longer of an interval. So we have to keep that in mind as we look forward. So a, a follow-up question then on, on that from one of our attendees um, asking, so you describe a potential wave or potential sawtooth or, or series of, of waves in, in the coming um, months and year. Um, and the, so the question is, can we expect to be infected at some point before a vaccine is developed if public health interventions are, are reduced? And should we look into a continual practicing of social distancing and use of PPE in clinical settings from here on out? Will this be the, the new normal is the question. Yeah. Ask me your crystal ball. Yeah, my crystal ball. I mean, you know, it's, it's very dangerous looking into the crystal ball, you know, but, uh, you know, I, again, I think that, you know, what, what guides my impressions are, um, are the biology of these viruses, the, the fact that they're envelope, the ecology, the epidemiology uh, of, of other respiratory uh, pathogens and what this pathogen has shown us to date. And what it has shown us it is that it is very, very effective at human-to-human -human transmission. Um, and, and, it, and, and so we can expect that um, it will stick around until uh, the population all has natural immunity through infection uh, or that there's an effective vaccine. 
that provides uh, protection against against the virus. And it is uh, my uh, my perspective that until until either one of those eventualities takes place, that uh, that SARS-CoV-2 will be part of will be part of the conversation. And 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 as far as you know, the timing of uh, when do you when do you reduce or when do you uh, limit uh, social distancing or other public health measures? Uh, you know, in the very famous words of Dr. Fauci, you know, the, the, the virus is going to tell us that, right? Like we, we need to do what we're doing to get the case counts down. We need to redouble our efforts to have increased capacity for testing. We can't know who's infected unless we have an effective, con a, a, an accurate uh, and timely confirmatory test. And it's not just knowing, it's that test that allows us to do all the downstream public health stuff that's not gonna make it go away. It's going to buy us time. So the downstream public health stuff is isolation of cases, detailed contact tracing, uh, and quarantine of those who have been exposed until they're outside of that, that window at which they may manifest symptoms so that we don't have ongoing propagation. Uh, and similarly, all the things that we're doing in the healthcare environment to protect healthcare workers and those that support healthcare workers, um, we need to have those in place. We need to have those in place because we're, this is the workforce. This is the workforce that are on the receiving end of taking care of these individuals. So um, time will tell, and, and this is gonna be iterative and we're gonna need to adjust policies as, as the virus uh, you know, shows us what it's doing. Um, so some, some follow-up questions come up just one question is what can you what can you tell us about whether the virus might be mutating and what we might expect to see then down the line um and a, and a re potentially related question about individuals who appear to have who who have a confirmed case and then appear to be having a second uh confirmed case and and how do we interpret that what what might that tell us yeah, no, I think that is a wonderful, wonderful question. Um, and again, this goes back to the pathogen and the host, okay? So we'll just stick with the pathogen for a second. You know, one, one nice thing, and um, again, I'll speak from Ebola because I spent a lot of time thinking about uh, Ebola, both in the clinical world and also in the laboratory setting. Um, you know, we, we have robust capacity to uh to uh to sequence this virus uh and and this is happening now and it's going to be happening on an ongoing basis we're doing it here researchers are doing it all over the world there are enormous sample sets that are going to become available and so if the virus changes um it's not going to be able to do it without us knowing so we're, we're paying close attention now um my understanding of the endemic human coronaviruses is, is that it's not the pathogen, it's not um, a shift or you know, change of the antigenicity of the pathogen that predisposes to recurrent infections of the endemic human coronaviruses in people. It's actually, the, it's actually on the, more on the host side, which is in, which is in contrast to uh, influenza, where we have these two concepts of, uh, of, of seasonal drift where there's antigenic drift on the surface uh, glycoproteins of the virus, the HA and the NA of influenza, and it's changes in those proteins that make us, you know, uh, lose susceptibility, uh, you know, maintain susceptibility from one year to the next because the virus change changes on us. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case with uh, the endemic human coronaviruses. Now, again, we're gonna find out about this virus because there's a lot of sequencing going on uh, and whether or not that would be the case here. So far, I have not seen any evidence to suggest that's the case. Then you raise a question of, well, what about reinfection? And the answer is we don't have a great answer about this. What we do know is that there's you know four uh, 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 endemic human coronaviruses, and we know that if you're infected, you get a mild, a cold, or whatever. One year, maybe in another couple of years or whatever, you can you can become reinfected with that same virus. Now, is that because you have a focal and mild infection, and consequently? you do not develop a, a systemic and sustained immune response that when you're re-exposed to that virus, you have a mem an adequate memory response that goes in and that has antigen-specific T cells and high affinity, high titer antibody responses that go in and, and take care of the problem. 
Um, is it, does it have to do with something about the mild or the local uh, nature of that infection? Perhaps. I mean, it seems, and, and might the same hold? Again, I'm, I'm, I don't, I'd be careful not to speculate too much, but if you have a mild and non-systemic, uh, you know, which may have to do with the inoculum or other features, um, are you then at risk of reinfection? The answer is we don't know. We need more information. But it seems implausible. Uh, at least, you know, understanding of the biology that we know that in the absence of the virus shifting, if you develop uh, a severe infection, lower tract infection, uh, and, and, and certainly in people that develop systemic infection, you know, viremia happens in at least in a subset and how often it happens, I think needs to be better clarified at the population level. But if you have a systemic infection and you develop severe to uh, critical illness, it seems implausible that in the absence of the pathogen changing, that you can become reinfected. Um, we'll see, we don't know. And then there's the issue of persistence. You know, you were infected and then the virus found a place that it likes to hang out and then it just rears its head again. I mean, we learned so much about persistence with Ebola from, I mean, Ebola has been around for forever, right? Not forever, but for a long time. 1976 was, uh, was when it was first discovered. Uh, and it took the outbreak in 2013 to 16 to really get insight into the immune protected sites and when it pops back. And we're still learning about that. So there's this issue of persistence. So Joe, I didn't answer your question fully, but I, I gave you a little bit of information. No, thank you. That's, that's a great answer. So um, another question that I, I think follows nicely on this from one of our participants is a question about testing. So. We've been hearing about testing that aren't optimal. We're hearing now more about serological testing different from the um, nasopharyngeal testing that, that we've been, been seeing for the virus. Can you talk about both of those and, and challenges of the tests and what we can expect in terms of how testing might evolve during this time? Yeah, I, I, think, I think the way the testing is going to evolve is that we're going to have uh, more and more uh, platforms available uh, uh, that will, you know, as we buy, as, the, as you know, the sort of more time passes that will become uh, vetted, that they will find their niches, that there'll be increased manufacturing and availability capacity. I think that's happening slower than any of us, you know, would like. I think we can simply acknowledge that. Um, but that there's going to be ongoing expansion of both, both molecular tests uh, for early diagnostics during the acute phase as well as serologic tests, which, which are fundamentally important. Now, the issue on serologic tests is, you know, have I been exposed and, and infected and do I remain susceptible? And there's a lot of discussion around serologic tests and they're very important. We, we need a good serologic test to say prior infection. And that's really, I mean, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about acute illness. Acute illness, you need a molecular test, a respiratory specimen, we can talk about that. but. Have I been previously infected and do I have, uh, you know, do I have evidence, evidence of, not definitive, but evidence of immunity? Um, and, you know, we've already seen from some of the, the studies that have come out in serologic tests that if you test too early, sensitivity is an issue, so you might not pick it up. Uh, and then if you test late, um, specificity is still going to be an issue. So, in other words, do you have a positive test because you have antibodies to this particular pathogen? Or, as I mentioned before, there is the potential for cross-reactivity with, uh, with other antigens, not just, so the, the most obvious other antigens are the, the antigens from the endemic uh, circulating human coronaviruses. We have to make, we have to be able to clearly distinguish between a, a positive serologic test that says, yes, COVID, but not you know, uh, not the other endemic uh, coronaviruses. And that has to do with assay development. It has to do with uh, inter appropriate internal controls in uh, the laboratory test, as well as appropriate um, uh, um, uh, co cohorts. Uh, uh, so uh, controls, population controls, uh, where uh, people have not been exposed to COVID and no, no exposure, but may have been exposed to the endemic coronaviruses so that the sensitivity and specificity of those assays can be clearly defined. Let me ask you, there's a, a, a couple of questions touching on some of the, the um, therapeutics uh, such as remdesivir or um, Plaquenil um, that some that are, are being um, used off-label anecdotally and uh, 
so a question from one of our speakers. So in, in one of the slides that you shared, it looks like some of those uh, medications are not are not recommended as, as some of the, the guidelines that are emerging. Um, but I think there's curiosity about your own thoughts clinically and, and how how we can think about whether or not these are used in some of our institutions, these are more routinely available for use and, and your thoughts about whether those should be utilized and when. Sure. Um, so, you know, the, the, uh, I participated in the, uh, the panel for the writing committee for the Society of uh, Critical Care Medicine's Surviving Sepsis campaign guidelines uh, for management of adult COVID patients. Uh, I was one of a number of uh, voices, expert voices, and it's largely a panel of people that have experience writing guidelines, uh, experience in sepsis, experience in ARDS, and there were a number of people on the panel who was my honor to work with uh, that have, you know, a lot of clinical experience with uh, SARS and MERS previously and sort of been informed by by that literature. So, you know, as you know, when you when you write guidelines, you know, the guidelines have to be uh, informed by the best available evidence. Uh, and, and right now we're largely operating in the absence of high quality evidence. And so in the absence of high quality evidence, uh, what we need are uh, randomized clinical trials to uh, determine uh, efficacy of, of any one of uh, any one any number of these uh, uh, experimental therapies. Having said that, you know, I, I'm also at the bedside and, and I, you know, uh, and so when you're, when you're faced, we're, we're not, I'm not a therapeutic nihilist either. You know, we, we don't sit there and say, hey, you know, there's nothing that we can do when you have somebody that's progressively worsening and, and becoming critically ill in front of you, your, uh, your intention is to try to do something. Uh, and so uh, I'm not going to criticize others for, using uh, Plaquenil or using off-label remdesivir uh, or others, but I will advocate for the need to study these drugs in a systematic way and not to become overly rooted in our own biases and our own sort of observations. I mean, I have, I'm already developing my own, some of my own biases by what I've seen at the bedside, um, but I'm very cautious about not to put uh, some sort of systematic approach to therapy in place in the absence of, uh, of evidence that strongly supports it. So it doesn't mean that I won't use things, but I try to be thoughtful about uh, on an individual, uh, you know, a case by case basis. Thank you. Um, another question that we have from one of our participants is, is a, a broader one. Um, stepping back and leveraging your experience with, with Ebola and with viruses throughout your career, how long does it take to truly understand the depth and mechanisms of, of a new virus? It seems to be a long time. <laughs> um, you know, I, I'm, I'm, to be honest with you, you know, I'm, I'm still, I'm still, you know, from my perspective, I'm still getting started with this. And you, Ebola has been, Ebola is, 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 is fascinating. And I really think that, you know, I, everybody has different approaches, but my, my approach is, I, I um, you know, uh, we need to dissect these diseases. And, and in the setting of this, this particular disease, you know, we have the opportunity to, and we're, we're making this effort to very, very thoughtfully collect clinical and physiologic data to very, very thoughtfully collect uh, human biospecimens on a very close interval and longitudinally during illness uh, progression and recovery uh, as to, to, to query uh, the pathogen in the host. What is the pathogen doing in different compartments, the upper versus the lower uh, respiratory tract? What is the pathogen doing in the blood compartment? How does that correlate or relate with clinical and physiologic findings and specific interventions at the bedside? And we live in an age of omics. We live in the age where we are able to query soluble host mediators, 5,000 soluble host mediators from 100 microliters of plasma. You know, and if you do this in a careful and thoughtful way, looking at those and the cellular uh, the deep immunophenotyping of cells, their expression profile, what they're doing at the uh, transcriptional level and the epigenetic level, by, by pulling this information and sort of saying, well, I gave, 
uh, tocilizumab on day 10 of illness. And look at what happened on day nine versus 10 to 11 and beginning to inf make inferences uh, about what happens with the natural history in the setting and in the absence. One of the challenges that I've observed, because again, I'm, I'm interested in basic and in translational research is we do these trials and something works or doesn't work. Uh, and then we're stuck with, it didn't work, but we don't know why it didn't work. We don't know mechanism. And I think, you know, this pandemic offers a unique opportunity to, uh, we need to prioritize uh, therapies and vaccines, but we have to be careful not to deprioritize detailed studies that give us insight into why. We need to know why. We need to know why it worked and why it didn't work. We need to know why it didn't work so that next time, well, maybe that's not such a good idea because look back over here. We need to know why it worked because for the next one, and this won't be the last, you know, emerging infection. Hopefully it'll be the, you know, the, the you know, hopefully it'll be the only, you know, severe global pandemic that we all see in our lifetime. But we know emerging infections do that. They just keep emerging. We need to know what's driving it on the pathogen and host side. So you gave me an opportunity to get on my soapbox and I'll get off of it. <laughs> Um, so one question, this is more about the, the biology and the clinical presentation of, of COVID-19 is, um, why do we see respiratory viruses, um, with some, some GI kind of manifestations and, and clinical symptoms? And, and what does that tell us about, about this class of viruses? Yes. So, you know, um, so the the receptor for so the the receptor for SARS-CoV-2 is the is the ACE2 receptor, which is present on respiratory epithelial cells and pneumocytes. It's also pre present on uh, epithe uh, epithelial cells of the gastrointestinal tract. And so, is it possible that the virus has a tropism for the the GI tract? I suspect that's the case, but I don't know. And the reason I don't know is because I haven't seen those those autopsy findings yet. Now uh, that's another piece. I mean, we need to be thoughtful. I mean, again, you know, uh, it is a tragedy how many people are are dying of this disease. But we need to take uh, an opportunity to learn uh, among appropriately consented individuals to really learn. Uh, about what's happening in the postmortem specimens that will tell us about the detailed tissue tropism that will inform uh, pathogen versus host contribution to tissue injury uh, and and uh, and failure, uh, as an example. So you know uh, the same question came up. It's, it is interesting because you know there is a diarrheal phase of this illness, um, and again whether that has to do with uh, direct infection or a, a soluble mediator of, from the host side or from the pathogen side. Um, you know, we've actually uh, are addressing those same types of questions in Ebola where the diarrhea in Ebola, you know, comparatively speaking, is appears to be more profound. I mean, large volume secretory diarrhea, liters and liters a day, a day that contributes you know, in this, you know, diarrhea is certainly is present, but it appears to be, it also appears to be secretory. It doesn't, have, I have not heard or seen clinical reports with mucus and blood, but again, we don't know these things definitively, um, but I think that has to be unraveled as well, because it's just one more, one more area that we could target to help perhaps mitigate either symptoms or overall pathogenesis. So a, a broader question, more of a, a policy question for you from one of our participants. What are your thoughts on, on nationwide testing, uh, perhaps the serologic testing and perhaps immunity cards uh, to introduce people back to society and to help open up our, our economy as to, there have been some proposals floated around that? Yeah, um, you know, I think that uh, that increased testing is extremely important uh, and that I think that, you know, we're in unprecedented times, right? So we're in unprecedented times. And so, you know, having availability to know acute infection or uh, whether you've recovered uh, and, you know, presumably have some degree of susceptibility, even to the degree to begin to untangle, you know, I'm confident I got a serologic test. I've been exposed, but then you get reinfected. 
then you can begin to study those people more clearly to say, wait a second, no, they were definitively uh, exposed and now we need to, and now they have become reinfected X number of months later. Like that's a cohort we need to understand because, because they had a definitive, you know, an accurate serologic test that said they absolutely had previously been exposed. They developed a humoral response and here they are presenting with this severity of illness. Um, as far as public health measures, Look, I think that that we, as as locally, uh, um, uh, regionally, uh, nationally, internationally, we need to pull out all the stops. I mean, we need to pull out all the stops uh, to uh, to understand, you know, who's infected, what, you know, um, where this virus is reemerging. Because again, my my again, I hate to talk about the crystal ball, but, but my crystal ball says that. Um, in the absence of the vaccine and in the presence of ongoing susceptibles, I just can't conceive of a scenario where this where this goes away. Um, and so, in the setting of that, um, we need to go back to uh, we're, we're we're at the we're at the end of it, where it's all the social distancing. We when it comes down, we need to be able to back off of this and be able to say we can do. Um, at, at lower levels of circulation, we can do careful case isolation, uh, the contact tracing, the quarantining, all those public health measures that we, we got, got right past all those because we went straight from, you know, in a, in a very short period of time, I showed you the graph in the United States in a month or so where there's no, there was no capacity or time for that. We went straight to social distancing. But as this comes down, we need those things. And fundamental to it is, the, is, is, is having a confirmatory test. But, but the test without all the other stuff doesn't work either. You gotta have the, the robust public health capacity. So um, going back with another question to your discussion earlier of the need to prioritize among the different uh, kinds of research across the, the spectrum from bench to bedside, can you say a little bit more about he, how we might prioritize clinical trials and some of the bench um, science that you alluded to earlier and maybe maybe speak to what targets and processes are limited resources, limited public health, limited resources should be directed to. And the, the second part of that, that question is how can, can we as a scientific uh, community uh, sort through the influx of studies that are proposed or developed and identify how to, how to best target our resources and, and time um, to, to maximize what we learn? Yeah, that, that is an excellent, excellent question. Um, and, you know, what I can say is, and we all know this, I mean, we're caught off guard, right? Like nobody was expecting that 2019 to 2020 was going to be, you know, the, the year of the global COVID pandemic, you know. Um, now, having said that, you said, well, how could you be caught off guard? You know, we're, you know, I mean, we, we prepare for these things and, and every, I mean, as much as we prepare, I mean, um, you know, factor shift. We, we thought that this was going to be influenza, right? Like, but, you know, Mother Nature's got all things, all sorts of things in store for us. So it wasn't influenza, it was COVID. And so, um, you know, but, but when you're, but we need to regain our footing, right? Like we need to regain our footing. And in the same, in the setting of regaining our footing, all those smart people that are out there, both in uh, in academia, but in government, in through increasingly coordinated and concerted efforts, we need to do the hard work to to sort through this. We need to come from reactive to you know come back, be a little bit more thoughtful to to do the hard work of sorting through the biology to say, yeah, this we got to go back to our prioritization list. This is what I was referring to. Um, with, with the, the playbook for the standard process. The standard process for vetting therapeutics is, looks like it's got in vitro, it's promising in vitro, but there was a, there's a gazillion, uh, a gazillion compounds that have in vitro promise that have failed, you know, uh, either in small or large animal models, or and certainly when they come into the, you know, into the human. I mean, the, the, the bacterial sepsis field is a wasteland of you know host and and pathogen uh, targeted things that for decades you know were had promised but didn't pan out so so you know this is about organization and coordinate and i know i know that the leaders uh certainly at nih we we hear about it i know that the leaders uh at academic organizations are having these thoughts 
and that we need to keep we need to keep working on it. We need to keep talking about it. We need to coordinate. We need to prioritize. We need to do. There's no shortcut. We just need we you know and and we need we need leadership around this. Uh, and so I, I think we're moving in that direction. I, I'm I'm optimistic that we're moving in that direction. That's that's great and very very reassuring and hopeful that that that's your that that's your 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 feelings. So that's. Um, Let's, let's move to a, um, a slightly different question, uh, circling back again to some of the, the biology and the what's known about the transmission of the, this virus that, so the, and, and others. The question is, can we expect to see the versions of more viruses like this one coming from animals to humans? And the, the second part of that question is, you alluded to an intermediary host uh, about which not very much is known. And can you say any more just mechanistically what, what that might be? might be just generally yeah um so so we know that this is the ecology of emerging viruses um that's not my particular area of focus i have colleagues that i work closely with with it where this is their particular area of focus um and you know if you look at the at the pathogens that have you know sort of emerged or re-emerged many 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 of them are, are zoonotic. So they come from uh, an animal host, a, a reservoir in nature. Uh, and that because of, you know, the changing uh, of our interaction with where these uh, reservoirs hide in nature and, you know, perhaps the encroachment on the forests and increased development and, and these types of environmental changes, you know, we're seeing more and more of these, uh, of these spillover events from pathogens that have been happy in their animal reservoir that are now you know, spilling over. And it's like a trial and error. They spill over into uh, humans and most of them are dead end. You know, they're like, oh, wrong host, that didn't work. Uh, and, and that's it. But every so often, one of them gains a foothold. That's the same concept that applies to the, the concerns about pandemic influenza where wa wild waterfowl or domestic poultry are, are thought to harbor you know, all, many, not all, but most of the subtypes of influenza and some of them every so often spill over from uh, a bird or a pig into a human. And for the most part, they, they sort of, it's, it's a dead end host. They don't result in human to human transmission and they don't result in sustained human to human transmission. So um, if, if, if we had the ability to definitively say, well, which one of those is going to be uh, effectively host adapted to, for sustained human human spread, spread, you know, I wouldn't be doing this. I would be, you know, living my, on my ranch somewhere, you know, with, with a, a gazillion dollars in my pocket, you know, because, you know, that's the million dollar question, right? And we don't have the answer. But what we do know is that these pathogens continue to emerge. Uh, that you know that the you know that that they the the potential for what we're seeing now has always existed, and now we're just seeing it at at a, at a global scale. And so to say, does it continue to? Of course, it continues to exist. Do we need to live in fear? You know, we don't need to live in fear. What we need to do is what we are trying to do, which is to respond. We need to be prepared. We need to go back and have, to have an iterative process to say. What did we do well, and what didn't we do well, and how can we how can we adjust this for the for the next time? Uh, yeah, Richard, well, that's a wonderful note to to end on. We're unfortunately coming to the end of our time. It has been just a tremendous pleasure uh, to talk with you and to, to gain a better understanding of this pandemic uh, from you. And thank you again for all of your 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 work and for your your time. Uh, today. We're, we're just incredibly grateful as a community to have had you with us today. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Julia, and thank you to the panel, and thanks to everybody out there that's listening, and for everybody. I know everybody's working hard, and it's not just the docs and the nurses. It's the people that are keeping the hospitals clean and keeping the cafeterias filled, so we need to recognize each other. We need to be kind to each other, and we need to, we need to keep doing what we're doing because we're, 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 there's a lot more work to be done. <laughs>